Good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel Hemet. My name is Michael and we're so glad you're here to worship with us today. For those at home, we hope you'll enjoy today's service as well. So sit back for just a minute because we have a few announcements we'd like to share with you. Hey, all you dudes out there. This Friday, April 19th, our Crosswalk Men's Ministry is hosting a men's dinner. We've got one feast of a meal planned for you coupled with some worship and a teaching from God's Word. If you want to be a part of this epic evening, then come sign up at the Welcome Center after service today. The cost is only $10, and today is the last day to register, so don't wait too long. Our Young at Heart ministry is thrilled to invite you to their upcoming potluck event this Thursday, which will be held after their regular meeting. Today is the last day to sign up and reserve your spot if you would like to bring a dish or participate in this gathering, please be sure to sign up at the Welcome Center after service. Hey parents, we've got some exciting news to share with you. If you're looking for a fun, meaningful way to help your kids learn about sharing the gospel and serving others, you won't want to miss our His Kids Bible Club. We've got a meeting coming up next Thursday, the 27th, at the home of Paul and Lynn Fuel. Our kids are sure to have a blast with plenty of delicious food, fun games, and engaging Bible lessons. If you're interested or have any questions, please don't hesitate to stop by the Welcome Center or chat with Paul and Lynn Fuel after service. And of course, after today's message, we invite you to stop on by the Cornelia Cafe. This month's special drinks are New Creation and Sweet and Salty. As we continue our service today, please silence your phones. And if you want any more information regarding an event or ministry, you can download our app, check out our monthly bulletin, or visit our website at cchemet.org. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. Good morning, church. Please stand. Let's worship the Lord. Father God, we just are grateful to be here, Lord, to give you honor and praise, Lord. We want to thank you for all that you've done for us in our lives and what you're going to do here today, Lord, anticipating your presence and, and the movement of the Spirit into our hearts and minds, Lord, as we prepare our heart for the Word, Lord, and that these songs, Lord, would bless you and that we can be in one accord giving you glory and honor. So, Lord, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, what a privilege it is to be here together, worshiping you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. From the dawn of creation, the world has been crying out for hope, for a hero to save us. We long for the supernatural. But there is only one God who can save the day. So clear the stage, prepare the way, because heaven and earth are singing. Glory, hallelujah, let the whole world see the greatness of our of our God. His power is endless. He lives within us. We know the greatness of our Our Savior wears the crown. There's none who can stop him. Not even the grave could hold him down. But there is only one king who can save the day. So clear the stage, prepare the way, because heaven and earth are singing. Glory, hallelujah. Let the whole world see the greatness of our of our God. His power is endless. He 
knew what you were talking about. Contemptified of your great love. My phone was all on fire, there was no doubt. Bible believing and we're washed in your blood. But it was until I stumbled and made my mistake that I could know in my soul how amazing was great you told me blessing out of a tragedy you turned my whole song into a symphony and with your spirit living inside of me i'm a new creation i'm a new creation and now i know what i was talking about Went from my head into my heart When I was broken at the bottom I found You're my healer and redeemer Jesus That's who you are You brought me blessing out of a tragedy You turned my own song into a symphony And with your spirit living inside of me I'm a new creation, I'm a new creation, oh, 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 but it wasn't till I stumbled and made my mistakes that I could know in my soul how amazing was grace. You brought me blessing out of a tragedy. You turned my old song into a symphony. And with your spirit living inside of me, I'm a new creation. You brought me blessing out of a tragedy. You turned my old song into a symphony. And with your spirit living inside of me, I'm a new creation. I'm a new creation. Oh, oh, oh. I'm a new creation. Oh, oh, oh. I'm a new creation. And with your spirit living inside of me, I'm a new creation. I'm a new creation. Oh, Lord, we do thank you, Lord, for, for making us new, Lord, in you, that our old is gone. The old man is dead, and now we have the new life, Lord, with you, a new creation that you've, that you've created in us, Lord, the spirit, Lord, of love and joy and peace and hope. We are so grateful, Lord. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
I know the night has come Your will will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love My heart will sing your praise again Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You'll never fail Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You'll never fail me will 
change the way you love me. Nothing can change the way I belong to you. Yes, I do. Nothing can separate. say yeah. yeah. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we come before you this morning with thanksgiving in our heart that we can gather together in your presence, in your name, a fellowship to worship you, to glean from your word. And so as we continue on this morning, we pray that you would speak to us, each and every one of us individually and collectively as a church, that you might give us the direction that we might Follow after all the days of our life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone says, Amen. hey, tell someone you're glad to see him this morning. Would you do that? Super. We got a few things to cover this morning. First of all, uh, guys, pay attention, men, listen up. Uh, today's the last day to register for the men's dinner that's coming up right around the corner. You'll see that in your bulletin if you're not sure when it is and um, haven't been taking a look at your bulletin. Stop at the uh, information center on your way out and they'll just give you all that kind of stuff going on and you can register then because today's the last day, guys, to sign up. I don't want you to miss out. Also, VBS, uh, Vacation Bible School, uh, meeting today in the fellowship hall uh, immediately after service today. So if you're interested in helping out, let me tell you what's been going on the past several years. Uh, most churches that I'm aware of are now charging for Vacation Bible School. We have not, we do not, we will not. And um, most of them are uh, offering uh, VBS in the evening, and the reason for that is because it's a lot easier to get uh, volunteers to help out uh, because so many people are trying to uh, make ends meet by going to work. You know what that is, right? Uh, so we need you to volunteer. Uh, so if you have some time that you can donate for uh, five days, uh, Monday through Friday, we'll give you the dates. You can go and find out and uh, I would encourage you to do that. We want to put together a great program and to uh, just really uh, take the opportunity to plant those seeds of faith in the hearts of our, our young ones. Uh, the gathering is tonight. That means that we come uh, to the Fellowship Hall at 6.30. Uh, it's a time of uh, prayer where the elders are there to pray for our congregation, but I think tonight that, um, that it would be of us if we would also be praying for Israel, don't you think? And we're going to do that also this morning before we uh, get started here. So the gathering, it's a time of communion, time of uh, worship, and a time of prayer. So I encourage you to come out tonight, uh, especially if you haven't been to the gathering at all or in a long time, uh, why don't you make it a point to come tonight, especially tonight, and uh, just, just be a part of that. Uh, let me just read you a, uh, an email that I got, uh, Susie and I got from our friends, David and Marisa. Uh, they live in Tel Aviv, and so this is prior to uh, everything that you're aware of that's uh, been going on. 
I'll try to give you some highlights in a little bit. Uh, this is what he said. Uh, Shalom, friends. Uh, Israel has been on high alert uh, for a few days now as Iran has vowed revenge for the killing of several elite military personnel in a bracket. Men who were well known in the Middle East for their brutal acts against innocent people in the bracket. In Damascus, Syria, about a week ago. We have been waiting to see how this would unfold. The word imminent has been used repeatedly for the last several days, but it seems the time has come. There are a number of serious signs from Israel, Israeli government and throughout the region that some time of attack will probably happen tomorrow, Sunday, in the early morning hours. 2 a.m. Israel time is 7 p.m. Saturday night, East Coast time. Israel already has dozens of planes in the air and are ready for every possible scenario. Iran and Jordan have both just closed their airspace. We are in a safe place, as always. Pray that whatever happens, God will use this to lead Jews and Muslims to our Savior, Jesus, the Prince of Peace. God bless you, David and Marisa. I'm going to ask Scott Mayo if he'll come up and lead us in a prayer as he's coming up. Let me read from Psalm 122.6. This is the word of God. I want you to hear this. Pray for the peace of Israel. May they prosper who love you. Pray for the peace of Israel. May they prosper who love you. Got it. Can you guys hear me? Let's uh, lift up Israel together. Oh, Lord, um, we come before your throne with renewed urgency and uh, humble boldness because of the work that Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And, Lord, your word says of Israel that you never slumber or sleep. And, Lord, they need that desperately right now. We pray, Lord, that you who called yourself the Holy One of Israel would show yourself mighty. And, Lord, may Israel recognize its protector and its Messiah. And all of these things that are going on right now, Lord, open their eyes. We just pray, Lord, that you would give their political leaders, the wisdom of Solomon, that you would give their military leaders understanding and perseverance, Lord. We just ask that you would protect Israel, have your hand upon them, Lord. They have been surrounded by enemies in the past, and you have delivered them, and we ask for the same here in our day. And I pray, Lord, that uh, those that have lost loved ones already, Lord, that you would continue to comfort them. And, Lord, we pray ultimately that you would show your glory, your mighty hand to Israel and to the world. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that you still have a plan and a purpose for Israel. And I pray, Lord, that we would just show our unwavering support in this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. Appreciate that. I'm sure that you uh, all know the assault against Israel directly from Iran has come to an end. In order for the missiles and drones to get to their target, they had to cross Iraq and Jordan airspace. And as we heard from our friend in Tel Aviv, <clears throat> both of them had already closed their airspaces prior to that, and yet those drones and missiles came across. Jordan did shoot down some of the drones. Uh, they were able to claim that it was for the safety of their own people. We're certainly glad that they did. Iraq 
nothing. Iran has threatened any country that permits Israel to respond using their airspaces. But they would be severely retaliated upon. In addition to Israel's air defense, U.S. played a big part in defending Israel by using our aircraft to shoot down those incoming drones and missiles. 120 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles, 160-ish, I can't remember how many of the drones had come in. Israel claims to have been able to repel or shoot down or defend themselves by 99%. So that means somewhere in the neighborhood of four, five, whether it was drones or missiles, actually landed in the country. One of which uh, injured a seven-year-old girl as it landed in neighborhood shrapnel, entered into her house and uh, caused the injury also on a military base. <clears throat> Other than that, I'm not sure where they landed. So Israel claims that 99% was prevented. An IDF base had been hit, as I said. Hezbollah and Houthi. Rebels also attempted to coordinate an airstrike with Iran. After the attack, ID forces, IDF forces unleash airstrikes against weapon manufacturing plants that are in, along the Hezbollah in Lebanon. Israel has yet to strike Iran directly following this attack. Their ultimate plans for response remain unclear. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed last week to respond to any Iranian assault in kind. President Biden is advising Israel not to retaliate. Given that its air defense shot down roughly 99% of Iran's, using the number given by this report, 300 missiles and drones during Saturday's attack. Commentary on my part, that would be like the U.S. not responding if the Twin Towers had not completely collapsed. Only a few floors being damaged. The intent would have been there, and we would have recognized it, and we would have dealt with it under a different administration than we currently have. The intent to do great damage was in the minds of Saeed Ali, Osini Kahamani and his political regime. As a result of this attack, though Israel's defense appears to be strong and Iran's attack seems to be weak, Israel's defense capabilities have been exposed and they will be most definitely scrutinized over and over again to discover how they can be overwhelmed in the future. Imagine what would have happened if Iran had nuclear capabilities and or what will happen when they do. The same drones that Iran used in this attack are being currently supplied to Russia who is using them in their war against Ukraine. They are allies. There's absolutely no stretch of the imagination to see how they and other anti-Israeli nations group themselves together in alliance against the Jewish nation as prophesied in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Last week in our study through Nehemiah, we saw how different people groups that wouldn't normally be in cooperation with one another combined themselves in alliance against Nehemiah and the Jews who were rebuilding the wall around the city of Jerusalem. The enemy of my enemy has become my friend. The same thing is happening today against Israel. I've titled this morning's study in Nehemiah chapter 6, Self-interest 
versus God's interest. Let's take a peek and find out why. So pick up your Bible, turn it open to Nehemiah chapter 6 as we continue on through our study in that book. Verse 1. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Gisham, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, a coalition, if you would, heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors in the gates. That Sanballat and Gisham sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. And so I sent a messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them the same manner. But they thought to do me harm. We don't know how Nehemiah knew this to be true, but I'd like to make a suggestion, at least an application for this day and age that you and I live in. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 12, beginning at the very first verse, Paul describes to us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me remind you, once again, that Paul addressed the Christian believers and said in a shocking manner, what? Don't you know that you are the temple of God and that his spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, dwells within you? And in times past, we've looked at the work of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit moves in our life in a variety of different ways. The very first way is to convict us of our sin and to draw us into a relationship with Jesus Christ where we might be born again. Once we are, we're filled with that Spirit. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives gifts. The way it reads in King James is severally, in other words, many gifts, severally as he wills. So the Holy Spirit is the giver of these spiritual gifts, one of which, or two this morning that I'll relate. In verse 8 of chapter 12, it says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you wisdom and knowledge. Now, you don't walk around all wise when you have that gift, and you're not full of wisdom at all times. But when the need arises, you can count on the Holy Spirit to minister to you and give you, let me say it this way, because it comes from a supernatural being, the Holy Spirit, he gives you supernatural wisdom, supernatural knowledge. If we were to plug Nehemiah into this day and age, it would be, I would be absolutely positive. I'm really sure, though, that this is how it happened. That how did he know that they meant to harm him? The Lord revealed that to him in some fashion, some way. We're going to see it again before we close out this particular chapter. Knowledge. They thought to do me harm. Wisdom. <laughs> Why should... The work cease while I leave it and go down to you. Wisdom, don't go. Don't accept the invitation. Why? Because they mean to do you harm. Notice this, that Nehemiah doesn't get sidetracked by the cunning devices of his enemies. He stays focused. What has God called you to do? Are you focused on what he's called you to do? to be the man of God, the woman of God, that he, Jesus, died on the cross that you might become. Focus on the race that he set before you. Focused 
But all too often, when the enemy begins to attack us, we start looking at those particular areas where the attack is taking place, and we try to squelch it. We try to put it out. The little hot fires everywhere keeps us running until we're finally exhausted. When all along, we could just simply stop like Nehemiah, and we'll see him do this again and again. Stop and pray. Lord, what should I do? How should I respond? So he says, I'm not coming. <laughs> I, I know what's in your heart. I know what your secret little plan is. You intend to do me harm, and I'm not going to, hey, I got stuff to do. God's called me to rebuild this wall and hang these gates, and that's exactly what I'm going to be doing. Verse 5. Then Sanballat sent a servant to me as before. The fifth time. This time with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, quote, It is reported among the nations, and Gisham says, that you and the Jews plan to rebel, re rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall, that you may be their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, there is a king in Judah, and now these matters will be reported to the king, so come, therefore, and let us consult together. The enemy will not only lie to you, but he will lie about you. When Jesus was being accosted and falsely accused by the Jewish leaders, here's one of his responses as recorded in John chapter 8. This is what he says. Against their false accusations, you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. What he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Remember last week, we had taken notice that the enemy is constantly using the same tactics. He used these same tactics against Nehemiah. He used them against Jesus, and he's using them today against you. And since we know that, we can study those tactics so that we can be alert. Just like Israel was realizing that they were going to be under attack. And before the attack ever really happened, they had jets in the sky ready to shoot down the drones and the missiles that were coming their way. Be ready. Be alert. Your enemy, as recorded in the Bible, is like a roaring lion seeing whom he may devour. And you're in the crosshair. You are one of those that he wants to devour. Like Sanballat, Tobiah, and the rest of his gang wanted to destroy Nehemiah, the religious leaders of Jesus' day wanted to destroy him. And so the coalition of murderers, they meant to do me harm, and liars are falsely accusing Nehemiah of insurrection against King Artaxerxes, to whom Nehemiah was their cupbearer, saying that Nehemiah was positioning self to become an opposing king to our exercise. What do you do when people tell rumors about you? What do you do when people lie about you? And they do, and they will. Well, let's take a look at what Nehemiah did. Take a look at verse 
8, 9 with me, would you please? False accusation. Here's what we're going to tell King Artaxerxes. You're an insurrectionist. You're rebelling against him, claiming yourself to be an opposing king. Then I sent to him saying, no such thing as you say are being done. But you invent them in your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid, saying, their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Notice this quick prayer. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Jesus had a bold response in John 8, 44, wouldn't you say? You're of your father, the devil, a murderer, and a liar, and a father of lies. Well, Nehemiah has a pretty bold response as well. Hey, this is what we're going to tell Artaxerxes. You better come down here so we can straighten this all out. Come on, come on. Trying to intimidate them. Oh no, if this bad news gets back to King Artaxerxes, what's he going to do? He's going to send troops after us. Oh no, we better go and do what they say. No such things as you say are being done. First, Nehemiah refutes their false claims. Simply saying, it's not true. Not trying to prove it not getting embroiled in any argument, just simply stating the fact, not true. They understood why they were making these false claims. They were trying to make us afraid. When we're reacting to fear, oftentimes we're not rational, at least not spiritually rational. So Nehemiah just doesn't get rattled by this. This is a guy that we've seen over and over again in prayer. This is a guy that's confident in God. God's called me to do what he's called me to do, and I've been faithful to do what he's called me to do, and therefore, well, I've said it before, let me say it again. Man of God, in the will of God, is invincible until the work is done. Nehemiah, in the will of God, is invincible until the last gate is hung. What has God called you to do? Sad to say, some of you don't know. So how do you know if you're invincible today or not? Well, how do I know the will of God? Seek. Seek. Lord, what is it that you have called me to do? He wants you to call on him so that he can respond to you. He wants to reveal to you his plan for your life. The race that you're to run and the lane that you're to run it in. That's what he's called you. He wants to reveal that to you, but he doesn't just drop it out of the sky because you have to want to know. Because you were born for a time such as this. What's my purpose in the course of history in the United States of America, in Hemet, California? Why am I here? I belong in Hawaii. He understood that 
that they were making these claims. They were trying to make us afraid. By the way, the drone strike yesterday against Israel intended to do just that. The drones are noisy. They scare people before they ever strike. Those that have faced drones in the desert of Iraq know exactly what I'm talking about. We hear it coming, and a lump rises in your throat, and it keeps coming and keeps coming, and you know that it's going to strike. They're intended cause you to be consumed with fear and then to do their damage. So he doesn't get sidetracked. He refutes the claims. It's just simply as that. You're full of beans. And then secondly, Nehemiah does the most important thing that he can possibly do. He prays. Simple prayer. They're doing this because they, using the biblical terms that we just read, they're using this to make our hands weak so that the work will not be done. I'm praying, now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. It's a metaphor. What does it mean, strengthen my hands? Strengthen my determination to be who you've called me to be. Strengthen my resolve. Strengthen my courage. Give me courage. We're going to make them fearful, the enemies thought. Their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Their knees will be knocking together, and they'll be too afraid to continue God's work. Nehemiah prays, God, strengthen me to complete that race that you have set before me this day. Verse 10. Afterwards, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of the Laia, the son of Mehatabel, who was a secret informer. A secret informer. How does he know he's a secret informer? How does he know the plans of Tobiah? Supernatural knowledge coming to the person who needs it at the time to continue the work that God has set before him. Simple as that. It's not a hunch. It's not a feeling. It's knowledge given to him by the Holy Spirit. The Bible clearly claims in Luke chapter 12. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear, in the inner rooms, will be proclaimed on the housetop. Simply put, your sins will be exposed. The secret informer's identity has been exposed. The Holy Spirit exposed this so that it would not catch Nehemiah off guard. He's a man of prayer. He's a man of resolve. He's determined to do exactly what God has called him to do. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God. 
I went to his house, and he said, come on, come on with me. Come on, let, let, let's go where nobody else is going to be within the temple, and let us close the door of the temple, for they're coming to kill you, Nehemiah. Indeed, at night they will come to kill you. And I said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And then I perceived that God had not sent him at all. But that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this reason, he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way and sin, so that they might have cause for an evil report that they might reproach me. Fear. Is there something happening in your life right now that's bringing an element of fear? Whatever that is, you don't have to cave into it. Fear is not sent from God. Fear is always sent from the enemy. You can have confidence that God will see you through whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you're fearing at this moment, that God will cause you to be victorious. Notice two things. Number one, Nehemiah perceives that Shemaiah was a spy. I know what's going on. I see what's happening here. God's revealed this to me. And secondly, he considers it a sin to cave to fear. Me? God's called me to complete this work. It's not done yet. King David had a similar thought when he wrote in Psalm 56, In God I have put my trust. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Well, you might have a response to that. Well, man could shoot me. Man could beat me up. Man could do this, man could do that. Man can't do anything that God doesn't permit. Because the man of God and the will of God is invincible until the work is done. I'm not going to cave into fear. It's not going to motivate me. It's not going to get me sidetracked because I put my confidence in God. I put my trust in him King David said. And when your trust is in God, the next thing he says is, I will not be afraid. And there isn't anything that anybody can do to me that God does not allow. Verse 14. May God remember Tobiah and Sanballat. Another prayer. That, that's just three. In and, and 14 verses, this guy is constantly talking to the Lord. Asking the Lord for the resources that he needs, courage, boldness, resolve. Asking the Lord to dismantle what's going on. Those are lies. Put them away. By God, you remember Tobiah and Sanballat according to their works and their prophetesses. Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. 
Nehemiah comes against fear, and he comes against fear again, and he comes against it over and over and over again. I will not buckle to fear because that's a tool of the enemy, and he's not going to be victorious over me. Why should I hide? Nehemiah responds. Why should I cave in? I hope you're getting the idea that your prayers are much mightier weapons than your own defenses. Oh, I, I have to report to King Artaxerxes that what they're saying isn't true. We need to send some people uh, to go see the king to make sure. Well, let's, let's head off that, that false story that they're going to be telling about me. Let's send some... Oh. That, that's fear responding. Oh, I, I better go out and see what they want. They're going to start telling more stories about me. I better hide in the temple. They're going to come after me. None of that. Not one bit of it. He does not get side dropped. He prays. So never again in your life Utter the words similar to these. Well, I guess all we can do is pray. By the time you utter those words, you should have already been praying. And that's the best thing you can do. That's a mighty tool that God has given you. Abba, Father. Pave the way that I might complete what you called me to do. Verse 15, so the wall is finished. On the 25th day of Elu, in 52 days. And it happened. When all our enemies heard it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. The enemy was disturbed. The enemy was disheartened. The enemy was upset and perplexed and couldn't believe what was going on. And the enemy gave credit, not to Nehemiah, the cupbearer, who didn't know how to be a governor, who didn't know how to build a wall, and the goldsmiths, who knew nothing about building a wall. And so they concluded that this was a work of God. Remember how my David, my friend David, concluded his email. Let me go back and read that. As always, he said, pray that whatever happens, God will use this to lead Jews and Muslims to our Savior, Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Nehemiah was faithful, prayerful, and he continued on in the work that God had set before him. And so the enemies counted it not the work of Nehemiah and those that were living in the city at the time, but counted it as a work of God.
I wish that Israel would see their success against the attack that just recently happened as a work of God. By at least outward me looking at the reports, they're seeing it as their mighty defense capability. Over the course of history, they have been successful time and again against overwhelming odds. They really need to give God credit. Verse 17, also in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and letters of Tobiah came to them. For many in Judah were pledged to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and of Berechiah. Also, they reported his good deeds before me and reported my words to him. Tobiah sent letters to frighten them. Like I said last week, the outward attack, when it doesn't accomplish what the enemy wants it to do, he will then instigate an inward attack. Notice how the inward attack, attack has been intensifying. At first, we saw a few who rebelled. The way that we were reading is they would not put their shoulders to the work. And then it became known that some of the more prominent members of the community were taking advantage of the poorer members. Nehemiah had to straighten that out. And now we see that their spies and allies within the wall, the enemies of the citizens of Jerusalem within the wall. Think of it for a moment. Sanballat, Tobiah, and others didn't want the Jews to have a wall. Open borders. Why? Because it made them weak and vulnerable. And there were some within the city who were in agreement with Tobiah because they had some secret alliance that benefited them and not the entire community of Jerusalem. Their self-interest meant more to them than the safety of their own community. I think you get the picture. Same tactics over and over and over again against Nehemiah, against Jesus, as we saw, we recorded it, we read them off to you last week, and against you today and tomorrow. And if you know what these tactics are, you already have your defense. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this moment when we could enter into your word and see what happened thousands of years ago and realize that it's happening today. Whether it be in Jerusalem or in our own country, in our own states in our own counties, in our own cities, in our own homes. So, Lord, we pray like Nehemiah because we don't want to get sidetracked and run around, put out all the hot spots. We want to continue on in the work that you've called us to do. Your word boldly declares that before the foundations of the world, before you created the world, you knew us and you called us. He set in plan a method of our salvation. And the Holy Spirit 
to be our guarantor of eternity in your presence. And if we've been floundering for some time, not knowing exactly what it is that you've called us to do, who you've called us to be, we cry out to you this morning and say, Lord, reveal that truth to us. Because it's about time we got on with the business of your will in our life. In the name of Jesus, we pray and all God's people say, amen. amen. Let's stand, shall we? We have one more course to share with you this morning. Son of God, hold the measure of my days. Holy Lamb, spotless Lamb, you are worthy, I am not. For your throne I stand amazed. Is every tongue confess and every knee will bow to Jesus Christ the Lord forever? Here I praise His name. Your name is matchless, your name is priceless, your name is more than I could know. It's so far above me, the way that you love me was further than any love could go. In your name, in your name you took the blind man and you gave him back his sight. In your name you took the dead man And you brought him back to life In your name you took the prisoner And you opened up the door And I will sing before your throne forevermore Your name is matchless, your name is priceless your name is more than I could know. It's so far above me. The way that you love me was further than any love could go. Your name is matchless. Your name is priceless. Your name is more than I could know. It's so far above me. The way that you love me was further than any love could go. share something with you before we go home, okay? I don't want you to walk out of here this morning thinking that only Christians are in the crosshairs of Satan, of the devil. It may seem like it, especially if you are a Christian. But that's not the case. We've read where Jesus described who Satan is. He's a liar the father of lies. He's a murderer. And whether you're a Christian or not, you're made in the image of God. And Satan hates that. And so you are just as much a target as anybody else. But the problem is, if you're not a Christian, you have nowhere to run. No defense system. No heavenly father to turn to like Nehemiah. I want you to think about that. Giving your life to Jesus today guarantees you eternal life in his presence. 
giving your life to Jesus Christ today puts you as the candidate that once you pass away, and you will, that you will hear him, Jesus, say, well done, a good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And you can become a Christian today simply by confessing to him right where you're standing, right here, right now, that you are a sinner and that you're sorry for your sins and that you want to invite Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Savior. And I would suggest that you do that before you leave here this morning. And by the way, if you'd like to pray with someone, well, Wayne and Debbie are up here to pray for you or anyone that has any kind of prayer request whatsoever. And if we need more of our leadership to be here to pray, I'm sure they'll see that opportunity and they'll come and they'll be praying with you. May God bless you and may you enter into his kingdom forever and ever. Amen.